Hey, so I actually want to talk about um, some SARS-CoV-2 stuff first. So this general playlist is going to discuss large-scale patterns of evolution through the lens of sort of gene and genome evolution. Uh, but just because it's timely, um, I think it is actually really important to address some of this SARS-CoV-2 stuff, specifically because there are questions kind of floating around there that um, I think your expertise as evolutionary biologists is going to be really helpful for maybe helping your friends and family understand. So a lot of people are wondering where this virus could have come from, and they want to know, um, you know, this is a legitimate question early on, was this virus deliberately engineered by some sort of, you know, nefarious uh, state or, you know, rogue scientist or something like that? Um, and then also there, there are these questions about have has the virus mutated to the extent that there's no way for us to develop a vaccine because it's mutating too fast? Or has it uh, evolved in such a way that it's less virulent now and we're kind of wasting our time by social distancing and we should just kind of go back to normal? So just as kind of a timestamp for everybody, uh, right now when I'm recording this lecture, it's... Uh, it's March 30th, and so New York State is already above 60,000 cases. Uh, let's see if this loads. Yeah, so this, this is an NPR uh, coronavirus tracker, and there's a lot of cases throughout the U.S. The U.S. as a whole has nearly 150 cases and more than 2,500 deaths, and New York State alone has more than 60,000 cases and uh, more than a thousand deaths. So um, this is already a really serious pandemic worldwide, but also in particular in the U.S. And so some of these policy decisions that are still being floated around by um, certain politicians are, um, I think, still pretty problematic. I don't want to get too partisan, but uh, this is this is not the moment to stop uh, social distancing, I think, and I, I think a lot of epidemiologists agree. But there's some arguments that are um, out there that uh, are not being made by scientists, but they're being made by you know pundits or lawyers or politicians that were maybe overreacting still at this point. So I want to talk a little bit about how you can sort of, oops, <laughs> how you can sort of uh, kind of use your knowledge of evolutionary biology to help other people around you understand what's actually going on. So first of all, just a little bit of a con just a little bit of context for viruses in general. There's a lot of examples of um, emerging pathogens arising as a result of host shifting. So for example, in, in the late 70s, there was a parvovirus that was uh, that started to infect canines. And it original the original hosts are thought to have been cats and raccoons. Um, the original quote unquote SARS coronavirus uh, that emerged in two thousand three is thought to have had bats as its primary host. Um, West Nile virus also you know in still infects birds, but it uh, it infects humans as well. Um, yeah, there's there's a variety of Examples, oh yeah, human immunodeficiency virus, yeah. So HIV, very, very famously, probably infected certain primates, especially chimps and gorillas. Um, Sooty mangabees, I didn't know about that one. And uh, it was obviously jumped over to humans uh, in at some point in potentially the early 20th century, uh, somewhere, in, uh, somewhere in West Africa. And... Uh, that, that is obviously, you know, maybe the closest thing to a pandemic that we've had uh, before the current moment that we're in. So there's a lot of examples of viruses emerging de novo uh, from, as a result of some sort of host shifting dynamics. And to just sort of put some of this in context, you might not be able to see this in the video very well, but you can look at the PowerPoint. Um, there's a bunch of SARS-related coronaviruses. 
So on the this side, on the on the right hand side of your screen, there's a phylogeny of bats, mostly. And then I think this is uh, maybe like a civet or something. And then this is humans. Um, there's there's a variety of uh, mammal hosts on this side, and then there's the viral strains that infect different hosts on this side. And so if you remember from our uh, lecture on co-diversification, there's a lot of examples of you know multiple viruses infecting one host, but also um, some clear examples of host switching going on, right? So the the virus phylogeny doesn't perfectly recapitulate the mammal phylogeny over here. There are some examples where, um, you know, one, uh, you know, it does seem like this clade is primarily infecting this particular species of bat, but um, there's also examples uh, like in this clade right here where you can see some of the lines going across to their mammal host go towards one mammal and some go towards another. So this is consistent with the idea that there's a lot of kind of jumping around host-wise with uh, the coronaviruses. One way to sort of encapsulate this is with this kind of cool diagram. Uh, and so this, this is trying to show that there have been a number of different switches between different species of bats. Um, and then, you know, back and forth between bats and humans and some domesticated animals. Uh, there's a, a porpoise in here, which is pretty wacky. There's, there's birds, and just this diagram is just generally trying to denote different host switching dynamics. The beta coronaviridae, or the beta coronaviruses, um, are the group that the sort of original SARS and the, the Middle Eastern Respiratory sy Syndrome viral outbreak were associated with as well. So these are all probably um, something bat related and then some other mammal. <laughs> it's just kind of a potpourri over here. Uh, and this is a table that is just kind of summarizing some of the genetic changes that seem to be associated with um, host shifts. So don't memorize this, but it's it's here for you to look at if you want to. And, and the link to the papers and the notes section of this PowerPoint. So what do we think is happening with SARS-CoV-2? which is the virus that's causing the COVID-19 pandemic right now. So far, what we've, what scientists have shown is that most of the genome is, seems to be really similar to uh, a bat coronavirus that has already been sequenced. So that's what this phylogeny is showing. So the consensus phylogenetic tree which is just looking at like the whole genome and you know all the sort of genes together. What is, what's the overall kind of squint your eyes at it picture that comes out is that uh, this SARS-CoV-2 is most genetically and evolutionarily closely related to a bat coronavirus and more distantly related to something that seems to be in pangolins. Pangolins, in case you don't know, Super cool. If you guys, if you guys don't know what a pangolin is, are you even ESF students, really? But they're pretty much the best. But the bummer about pangolins is that they're sort of a hot commodity in some Chinese markets. Illegal trade. And so there's a lot of examples of uh, pangolins being used for uh, their scales medicinally uh, in, in different parts of uh, China and Asia in particular. And so there's uh, a lot of examples of yeah, pangolin persecution. Oof. Yeah, a lot of very, very sad pictures if you, if you look, if you just kind of Google image search pangolin illegal trade. Pangolins are native to uh, the old world tropics. So they're in Southeast Asia and Africa uh, and so pangolins are sometimes shipped into different places in China as, um, 
you know, f food or, or probably more likely traditional medicine. Yeah. Wah, wah. Bats are also sometimes eaten in China. And uh, we'll come back to that idea uh, pretty soon. So it seems that on a very particular part of the receptor binding domain, the RBD of uh, the spike protein in, uh, in the SARS-CoV-2, there's a much greater similarity to uh, coronavirus that was sequenced from a pangolin. So this is kind of cool evolutionarily. Obviously, it's very inconvenient and uh, very terrible, tragic for the world right now. But it's interesting evolutionarily because it suggests that there was potentially some genetic recombination that may have happened as a result of uh, concurrent viral infections in one of these two animals. So it's possible that uh, a pangolin that, already, that had a coronavirus infection actively happening was also infected by a bat coronavirus, for example. And this interaction within the pangolin may have caused uh, the formation of some viral particles that had genetic elements from the separate strains of coronavirus. And so what, what this is trying to show here is that this is the actual amino acid alignment. So these are all the amino acid, um, the nucleotide bases, or no, the amino acids, <laughs> not nucleotide bases. So, uh, so people have gone through and, and actually translated what the RNA sequence would be. And the, the human sequence is here. And then every time there's a difference, they write in a letter at the corresponding spot below it. So this is an alignment meant to illustrate how similar or different some of these different um, sequences are. And so the take home message here is that for this section of the genome, the human uh, coronavirus that, that we're dealing with right now is all pretty genetically homogenous across this section. And the pangolin at this section in particular only has one, two amino acids that are different. So this is very, very evolutionarily similar. And then all the bats that we've sequenced so far, all the bat coronaviruses that we've sequenced so far, have a lot more than two differences here because that's, that's what they're showing with these letters. Um, so it's possible that something like this could have happened because of convergent evolution. Um, but convergent evolution over such a long stretch of DNA seems to me less likely, but I'm, I'm not an expert in viral evolution. So uh, it, this is actually still something that's being actively debated in the evolutionary biology community and, and you know, people who are virologists and who are studying this kind of stuff. Uh, not everyone is buying into the pangolin hypothesis. Everyone agrees that over the, the general, the, the, the whole of the genome, the SARS-CoV-2 is most closely related to uh, some of the bat coronaviruses, but the significance of the similarity of the pangolin CoV-2 at, at this particular part of the spike uh, protein, that's, that's still actively debated. So this could change, but right now, this is the evidence that people are using to say, like, maybe pangolin was another intermediate host, or maybe the pangolin was the source for uh, a virus that is evolutionarily related to uh, part of the genome of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, so this is just kind of a general overview. Um, viral genomes have a pretty big range in size. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 happens to be around 30,000 base pairs, which is like, not tiny, um, but it, it also kind of underscores the fact that it's really a pretty small snippet of the genome that's that deviant. So it's it's more than you would expect by chance. I, I would be kind of surprised if convergent evolution were responsible for the similarity between the pangolin and the, the human SARS-CoV-2, but um, 
yeah, by and large, there's a lot of other DNA that, that really paints the picture that it's much more closely related to some of the bat stuff. Yeah, so this, this is kind of the way people are thinking about it right now, is that there was potentially some uh, cross-infection by, you know, either pangolin virus somehow got into, uh, infected a bat, and or, you know, bat virus somehow infected a pangolin. There could be unknown animal intermediaries. And then, obviously, at some point, it was transmitted to a human. And then humans have been transmitting it to other humans since then. So this kind of brings us to the idea of, you know, what how can we evaluate the hypothesis that this virus just emerged as a result of non-anthropogenic evolutionary processes, or at least, you know, non-laboratory mediated evolutionary processes. And so far, the scientific consensus seems to be that everything we can see from this organism's genome or from this virus's genome seems to be consistent with the way we understand coronaviruses and, and a lot of a lot of other viruses to evolve. So in, in a lot of ways, I, th I think this is kind of interesting to talk about because it sort of parallels the way that um, some creationism debates are framed. And it's it's basically the idea of, uh, you know, if, if you read Why Evolution is True by Jerry Coyne, the, the sort of general thought process that you might think about going through when you're talking about whether creationism is a, is a useful explanatory uh, body of uh, philosophy to explain, you know, sort of the natural world, is to think about how a creator would do things versus how we understand evolution to do things. And so, you know, the, the question that you could ask is just, you know, what would an organism or what would a virus be like if it were deliberately engineered? And what would it look like if it were the product of unassisted evolution? And so it, it, it seems everything we know about other viruses that ha have seemed to have emerged non, <laughs> you know, without the aid of any laboratory assistance the emerging pathogens seem to follow a pretty similar evolutionary trajectory. There's, there's really close similarity to a virus that happens to infect one or more other species. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 exhibits genomic features that are consistent with recombination in one or more non-human hosts. And I think this is really significant because if a pathogen were deliberately engineered, it's much more likely that a pathogen that already infects humans would be used as the starting point, right? Because, you know, these emerging pathogens often do result um, because of a chance sort of host shift, but that host shift is such a crapshoot. It's not like every virus that bats have will automatically infect humans. Um, and, it, you know, and it would be, it just seems really implausible that um, even a pretty dedicated team of scientists could go around just shuffling around different genomic components of viruses that infect like every combination of random mammals that could possibly be found in a Chinese wet market. Uh, it, it seems much more plausible to me that this virus emerged as a result of uh, evolution that's unassisted by humans, um, other than the fact that humans may have provided sort of the the setting for this evolutionary event to take place. So yeah, I guess I want to quickly show you some phylogenies and kind of try to place some of this stuff into context. Um, where are they? Yeah. So there's a variety of next strain phylogenies that I want to show you. So these, these next strain phylogenies are ways of displaying the evolutionary relatedness of different uh, coronavirus strains throughout the world. Uh, different coronavirus uh, 
clades throughout the world. And so this is just kind of an overview of the biogeography of the coronavirus. Explore the data yourself. I'll try to resize this so that you can actually see everything. So here you can actually watch the virus emerge. This is the dates going here. So right now we're still in 2019. Now we're in 2020. Now we're in February. And now we're in March. So these are all based on sequence data, um, which you can see, where's the tree? Show me the tree. options might be turn to the narrative oh wow all right I'm just gonna switch over to another view so this is this is a phylogeny of different beta coronaviruses. So this is this is kind of an extended view of some of the figures that I was showing you in in the PowerPoint earlier. Uh, this is the MERS Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, human coronavirus, novel coronavirus, and then SARS. So I think we're we're at this one. So we're the we're the little red point. So this is generally just a way of looking at uh, how the viruses are related to each other. Um, if we color right now by virus species, you're just seeing these different clades of viruses. And species is obviously, you know, a tricky concept here. But you're just seeing, you know, the, the clades of viruses be colored based on what their evolutionary relatedness seems to be to each other. Coloring them by host is actually pretty cool because you can see now that there's uh, there's some, the purple ones are bat, uh, have bats as their hosts. This one, where is it? Oh yeah, right, right down here. That's the civet that was probably involved in the, uh, in the, the sort of SARS 2003 outbreak. Humans are in red. Um, Man, we got all kinds of cuties though, like hedgehogs are over here, mice are up here. Color scheme is tricky. There's deer, there's cattle, there's buffalo. Uh, color by country is also potentially interesting as well, but I don't know if this is gonna really gonna, oh, okay, yeah. So China obviously figures really prominently in the uh, SARS, 2003 outbreak and the outbreak that's, you know, the pandemic that's happening now. Saudi Arabia is where MERS was, so that's it's an unfortunate color scheme, but um, obviously the United, Arab, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia had a lot of the MERS cases. Taiwan also had, was hit pretty hard by the, the 2003 SARS outbreak, and so was Hong Kong. France, a little bit less so. And then region, what does region say? Oh, okay, yeah, that just kind of breaks things up. So that's the overview of beta coronaviruses. Now this is the novel coronavirus. This is, this is SARS-CoV-2. And right now this is colored by a country, but we can, we can color it by region too. And the way it's doing things now is it's, it's actually placing the dots in time. So if you have branch length time selected here, you can see when these isolates uh, were collected. So this isn't necessarily the sequence date, but these are 
uh, I think when the when the specific uh, genetic sample was was taken, presumably. And so for a while, obviously the stuff down here was mostly from Asia. Um, but suddenly, a little bit later on, there's a lot of North America represented. And the other thing that's really noteworthy is that a lot of the samples from North America are in different parts of the phylogeny, even pretty far back. So this is a way of kind of studying the biogeography of this virus, which is pretty cool. So if we, if we ignore time and we just look at genetic divergence, we can also kind of make a little clade. We can just rearrange this. Oof, yeah, this is tricky. So now these are showing genetic distances. So how, how genetically different are these different strains? And what you can see is that there's some North American strains that definitely cluster together. So this is evidence that there's a lot of transmission happening within North America. And, you know, ditto for Europe. There's some, some situations where, you know, European strains are most closely related to European strains. But then there's also a lot of shifting around, right? So this is New Zealand. This is the USA. This is New Zealand. This is the USA. So there's there's definitely transmission happening among pretty pretty wide swaths of geography. Africa. A lot of the African sequences are grouping with with European travelers. So there's potentially some holiday travel there at work. Um, Asia. Yeah, is also uh, the the way that. Asia falls out in this phylogeny is consistent with the idea that there were a number of separate introductions into Europe, right? So you can see kind of the sort of blue or green with Asia and the lighter green with Europe kind of on top of each other. So I really encourage you to kind of play around with this. I know it's, you know, uh, oh, this is, this is influenza. So this is a different, I'll come back to this. Uh, I, I encourage you to play around with these, though, because they're, they're kind of a cool way to kind of get a sense for the way that phylogenies work, you know, by, by toggling among these different views of the phylogeny. I think it's actually a pretty cool way of, of seeing different ways of uh, representing evolutionary relatedness and uh, kind of wrapping your head around that and kind of getting, getting sort of just an intuitive sense for that. So I, I do want to talk a little bit about the fact that the virus has mutated. And it's a really trivial question that I'm setting up because I think a lot of you know the answer to this, but just in case you don't, because it's, you know, it, it's stressful times, right? Like it's hard to think about this stuff logically, but you all have the tools to know how to sort of answer these questions. And the reason these phylogenies look the way they do, right? So these, this is, I can show genetic divergence on this coronavirus. So this, um, the way they're displaying this is by substitutions, right? So there's 14 substitutions different between this strain here or something and one of the strains down here, right? no nucleotide mutations, nucleotide mutations, no amino acid mutations though. And then there's a, an amino acid mutation on some of these. However, even some of the ones that are fairly genetically distant don't really have a lot of amino acid differences. So in many cases, what's probably happening is neutral evolution. And so the reason that I want to bring this up is that some people online and elsewhere see phylogenies like this and they say, oh my Lord, Jeebus, like how are we gonna develop a vaccine if there's this much genetic diversity in the virus already? And the reason that we can still potentially develop vaccines is that there's not a lot of amino acid substitutions happening. Um, and the amino acid substitutions that are happening are not necessarily gonna be coding for parts of the virus that are actually gonna be um, things that antibodies will be targeting. 
So by and large, our kind of general understanding of the way coronaviruses evolve suggests that if we do develop a vaccine, it'll be really kind of immunologically relevant. It'll be useful for years. The flu evolves pretty quickly. And so you can see this is a this is a phylogeny of the flu showing different strains through time. This this is uh, right now the x-axis is time, right? So here they started sequencing a lot of flu down in 2008. There was there was more back there. It's just harder to sequence stuff. Um, it was more expensive or whatever. And so you can see now, you know, between 2018 and 2020, there's potentially like one, <laughs> you know, in 2019, there's one, two, three, four, five, six fairly different strains of the flu happening, right? Some of them are more similar to others. Yeah, vaccine selected, antigenetic advance, vaccine selected. Yeah, some of these weren't, some of these they didn't bother developing a vaccine for. Um, but the flu mutates fairly quickly, and that's why we need to continue to develop new vaccines for it all the time. And when we develop vaccines for the flu, a big part of what people are doing is looking at what seems to be proliferating uh, during the flu season of uh, the Southern Hemisphere. And then trying to figure out, you know, based on what's the most common in the Southern Hemisphere, what is likely to be the most common in the Northern Hemisphere during, during our flu season. And there's a little bit of wiggle room in flu vaccines. You know, you only have to, um, there's, there's not infinite viral evolution happening within the course of a six month period, but there is enough evolution happening over the course of 12 months or 24 months that you do need to develop new vaccines fairly regularly. The cool thing about coronaviruses is, is that um, they have a proofreading machine. So coronaviruses actually evolve up to three times more slowly than the influenza viruses. So that is actually really working in our favor. So there's, there's going to be fewer accidental mutations. There's going to be fewer substitutions per unit time in coronaviruses than there are in the flu. So despite the fact that there's a, there's a really decent chunk of genetic genomic diversity in the coronaviruses, uh, I think vaccines are likely to be still relevant. And this is a lot, um, this is taken in large part from uh, some stuff that Trevor Bedford has written. He's a, a research professor at, uh, where is he, Trevor Bedford. Yeah, yeah, so University of Washington, this, this dude actually like knows what he's talking about. Um, Google Scholar, yeah, yeah, he's, he's fine. He was, he was cited almost 1,300 times last year. So he's, he's a fairly well-respected epidemiologist, and he's been really vocal on Twitter, kind of publishing some really up-to-date uh, analyses and also some, some kind of quick and dirty opinions. But this is uh, uh, some of the sort of hope for the, the efficacy of the vaccine that we're hopefully going to develop you know, in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, comes from this Twitter thread that I saw a while ago. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the opposite question, which is um, is the virus mutating in a way that's actually going to decrease its virulence? And if that's happening, then we should then should we just stop social distancing so the economy can recover? And this, this theory is, is mostly being advanced by, uh, by this dude, Richard Epstein, who's from the Hoover Institution, uh, who has written a recent report that's circulating around in which he invokes sort of like a you know, seventh grade understanding of evolutionary biology, 
to suggest that uh, we're overreacting to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, yeah, so he's, he's written pretty recently that, you know, we're overblowing the number of deaths that are going to occur. Uh, he's, he's trying to equate COVID-19 to the flu. Yeah, just a lot of ridiculousness. And then I, I did want to kind of single out this one particular section where he says uh, the adaptive responses should reduce the exposures in the high risk groups given the tendency of, for the coronavirus to weaken over time. And so that's this journalist from the New Yorker kind of calling him out on having said this. And then his response is, well, what happens is it's an evolutionary tendency. So the mechanism is you start with people, some of whom have a very strong version of the virus and some of whom have a very weak version of the virus. If the strong version of the virus people are in contact with other people before they die, it will pass on. But if it turns out that you slow the time of interact of interaction down, either in an individual case or in the aggregate, these people are more likely to die before they could transfer the virus off to everyone else. So this is this is an example of someone knowing just enough, like, like he read, you know, he spent like an hour and a half looking at a Wikipedia page for epidemiology or something like that. And it's true that in very, very broad brushstrokes, um, some types of parasites and pathogens do tend to evolve decreased virulence through in evolutionary time. Um, unfortunately, it would be cool if that was working right now. Um, unfortunately, you know, COVID-19 is very serious. Like we should still be worried about a 2% mortality rate or a 1% mortality rate because the potential for infecting people is really huge. But the evolutionary process that he's talking about towards evolving, decreasing, uh, uh, virulence it's just not going to be relevant at the time scales that we need it to be. So it's, it's something that could potentially apply to a viral system where um, the viral infection were just killing people in like six hours or something. So if, if the virus was killing people, was legitimately killing people before they came into contact with anyone else, then what he's sort, what he's saying is semi plausible, but uh, yeah, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, so, it's so wrong. Um, the way SARS-CoV-2 is working now, it's asymptomatic in like 80% of cases, you know, and it doesn't immediately kill people even when it does end up being fatal. So it, there's a really good chance that more or less everyone's still looking at kind of an R naught of around two. So I I think this type of of logic and sort of invoking the idea of evolution, you know, he's basically just using the word evolution to sound like he knows what he's talking about. Um, it's really dangerous because some people really want to hear this for economic reasons. And so um He's wrong. There's a lot of experts that are debunking everything that he's saying, uh, but this idea is also out there. So I'm just bringing it to your attention in case you hear your relatives talking about it or your friends talking about it. Um, the virus is evolving where we can see it in these phylogenies, right? So this is, this is showing the genomic epidemiology of the novel coronavirus. This is this is showing the evolutionary divergence of the current, you know, little clades of coronavirus that are out there. Yeah. Region. Yeah. Um, but oh, this is all this is all Iceland. That's why these are all the Iceland strains. Yeah, 
sounds pretty wild. That's so nuts. So these are just the strains that have been sampled from Iceland. And what the, the wild thing is that Iceland is showing it's really is kind of a travel hub. Um, but the, the infections in Iceland are going to show kind of a, um, an evolutionary biogeography of having originated in different parts of the world. That's essentially the punchline for this one. still and we're still in February so it's not as exciting from an Iceland perspective but yeah you can see it's gonna yeah it's it, it's arriving in Iceland from a variety of different locations in, in uh, Europe and North America Ooh. yeah so I, I did want to bring this to your attention and it's just kind of I want to take this as an opportunity to really underscore the definitions that we use in this class and differentiate them from the way you might hear people talking about mutation and evolution. So if a virus mutates in pandemic movies, you know, in, in, you know, in horror movies or in sci-fi movies, a mutation almost always has like a dramatic phenotypic effect, right? And usually it gives you superpowers or it kills you or it makes the virus like super duper deadly all of a sudden. Um, most mutations that we observe as uh, substitutions in evolutionarily related organisms, they don't confer superpowers and more often than not, they're, they're pretty close to silent. They often don't have a strong effect on the phenotype. So just because there's a mutation doesn't mean you automatically have something totally different. Um, and just because there's evolution doesn't necessarily mean that the thing is becoming more powerful. So evolution isn't necessarily directional in either way. It doesn't, there's evolution in this, you know, there's definitely SARS-CoV-2 is exhibiting evolution, but it's not becoming more powerful. It's not necessarily becoming less powerful. There's, there's really no reason to suspect that it's going to follow those types of, you know, like, you know, I'm a freshman and I looked at the Wikipedia page for disease evolution or something, uh, you know, dynamics. And just because there's mutations doesn't mean that there's an infinity of strains that we can never hope to vaccinate against. So I think really all this is just to say that the people that you've been listening to so far um, actually do kind of know what they're talking about and that you know, social distancing is still super duper important. Um, and we still need to work on getting a vaccine developed. It's still really useful. And we still, we're just going to have to be really careful until then. Uh, so, so the, the vaccine issue is, is really interesting. Um, it's, it's likely that we're going to have to either keep social distancing or be super duper ready to start social distancing, like at the drop of a hat, um, for a while, you know, um, until there's a vaccine, really. Uh, but uh, the good news is that the vaccine, you know, will probably still be relevant 18 months from now when it's developed, hopefully. Um, the interesting news is that there might just just like we have to get revaccinated against the flu or you should be revaccinated against the flu uh, we might need to get revaccinated against SARS-CoV-2 every like two to five years or something like that so um, yeah I guess this just to kind of wrap up this figure I've shown before but there is um, some some pretty cool stuff that we can take advantage of in terms of our understanding of that the general evolutionary dynamics of coronaviruses and uh, our ability to to understand their evolutionary dynamics and to not exactly predict them but to kind of figure out what might be plausible uh, we we know that there are some 
regions of the genome that seem to be more genetically conserved. And there are some regions of coronavirus genomes that seem to exhibit more genetic diversity. So that's a really cool thing that we can do by comparing whole genomes is saying like, oh, which places look super duper similar to each other, which places seem like that's where a lot of, you know, neutral or non-neutral evolution is happening. And it seems like at least some of the outer capsid proteins, the spike S2, seem to be really genetically conserved. And so that's that's a potential area that we could target with a vaccine in the future, for example. Uh, there's also some structural proteins and viral enzymes that people might try uh, a variety of different kind of antiviral medications against that, that aren't like a vaccine-based treatment. Um, but I think we actually are in, um, it's just gonna take time uh, to, to figure out you know, for people to figure out how to beat this thing. And until then, you just have to got to keep being careful and keep washing those hands. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to talk about the central dogma of biology in the next video. So uh, thanks very much for listening. And uh, yeah, go like grab a coffee or something because there's a bunch more. Okay, bye.